The Story of the Lost Child by Eleanor Ferrante Translated by Anne Goldstein and dramatised for radio by Timberlake Wurtenbaker Starring Monica Dolan as Lena and Anastasia Hilly as Leela Episode 3 girl of four. Yeah, about five minutes ago. She went that way. Did you see a little girl of four? Her name is Tina. Yeah, I, I think so. She was at that stall over there. Tina! Emma, did you see Tina go anywhere? Did you see a little girl? Her name is Tina. I know Tina, yeah. I'm sure I saw her months ago. She was going towards the garden for the tall man. At every moment, we thought we'd found her. Tina. Every sighting was illusory. Did you see a child going towards the gardens? No. But I saw a little girl chasing a blue ball towards the Stradona. That was the rumour that prevailed. As Tina was chasing the ball, a huge lorry, mud-coloured, travelling at high speed, careered along the Stradoni, which was full of potholes. No one had seen anything. The lorry hadn't braked, but had disappeared along the Stradoni with Tina. On the street, nothing remained. Not a drop of blood, no clothing, nothing. The vehicle disappeared into nothing. And in that nothing, Tina was lost. That was one of the many rumours in the days and weeks spent searching for Tina. I was holding Emma in my arms, talking to Nino. Did you want to show off Emma? Make Nino interested in her? Tina. Did you feel neglected? One moment of inattention? The rumours kept flying. Enso was convinced the Solaras had taken Tina, but they were at the forefront of the search for her. No one in the neighbourhood had ever trusted the so-called forces of order. Everyone felt responsible, except, of course, for Nino. He kept repeating he had no responsibility. He had handed the child to her parents. The only one I trusted was Antonio. The Solaras organised a roundup of street peddlers. They arrested Stefano, of all people. He was recovering from his first heart attack when the cars came with their blazing lights and sirens. Then Reno, then Gennaro. They were all released. Armando Galliani appeared. He'd become a journalist for a small television company. He wanted to talk to you. Why did you let him? I've been investigating the aftermath of the earthquake for my television station. We're serious journalists trying to uncover what's going on in Naples. Really? Now I've been going around all the construction sites. I heard of a lorry that was scrapped in a hurry. Apparently because of some terrible thing it had been involved in. You're making that up. I'm repeating what I've heard. I have leads. You don't care about that lorry, the construction sites, or about my daughter. You get out! I'm only trying to help. Out! Now! Come, Armando. You were disgusting as a doctor, disgusting as a revolutionary, and now you're disgusting as a journalist! Get out! Tina is alive! She's too upset to hear anything like that. I'm sorry for her. I really wanted to help. Tell her that. I heard your father had died. How's your mother? She's living in France. Nadia? We don't talk about her. Italy has become a cesspool and we've all ended up in it. The workers' parties are full of honest people who've been left without hope. Armando did track down the burnt wreck of an old lorry and connected it to Tina's disappearance. The news caused a sensation for a while, until it was ascertained there was no possible connection between the burnt-out vehicle and Tina's disappearance. How could you bring that shit into my house? The neighbourhood was divided into those who thought Tina was dead and those who were convinced she was alive and a prisoner somewhere. But I noticed how quickly you were losing your aura of invincibility. You were no longer an alternative to the Solaras. People began to avoid you. I didn't notice. I discovered Gennaro had started using heroin again. He ran away from us. I was sure he'd gone to his father, Stefano. I went there. Stefano had been solid. Now he was skin and bones. The heart attack had crushed him. He was frightened. He'd closed the grocery and Ada was asking him for money, as was his sister and his mother. 
Marisa was his new partner. You think that by allowing Gennaro back on drugs, you'll get money from me? I threw him out, but it'll take a lot of money to get him treated. It's all your fault, Leela. Marisa, you were married to Alfonso, yeah. Two children that weren't your husband's but Michele's. You left him to live with Stefano when he was with Ada. What exactly do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> I've lost everything and it's all because of you, Leela. <laughs> I had grocery stores, houses, money. I was a rich man. You ruined me. Oh, you ruined yourself, Stefano. You had money from your father and you lost it all. You should have been more clever. You ruined everyone, Leela. Stefano was ruined because he married you. Alfonso was ruined because of you. You've ruined us all. You're worse than the Solaris and whoever stole your child did a good thing. Oh. Let's go, Leela. Let's go and find Gennaro. Marisa doesn't mean what she said. We'll find Gennaro at Reno's house. Reno wanted money as well. They all wanted money. I got hold of Gennaro and I walked out with him. You have money, Mama. Why don't you just give it to him? Is that how you want to end up? Like your Uncle Reno? The house became an inferno. I could hear the shouts. Dede would start crying. Elsa wanted to call the police. We succeeded in getting Gennaro off heroin. But my daughters had become afraid of you. I always did my best for them. Yes, when I was travelling, promoting my books, and, I have to admit, escaping from them, you looked after my daughters. And I saw what you didn't see. Dede. But first, Reno disappeared. First? Is there an order to a life? First? Second? Gennaro and Stefano eventually found Reno in a car along the old tracks. His eyes were open. His unshaved beard covered his face like an overgrown plant. Stefano started kicking the corpse. You were shit as a boy, and you remained a shit. You deserve your shit death. You ruined my sister, and you ruined your nephews. Look, Gennaro, look what's waiting for you. Look at your uncle! Stop it! You ruined my son, you shit. You put him on drugs. Take this, you shit! And this! You disgust me, Pa. It's embarrassing <coughs> to be your son. The only people I respect in this whole neighborhood are my mother and Enzo. Now, stop it! Pinuccia didn't even pretend to mourn her husband. I mourned the brother who had defended me from a violent father, who wanted me to have an education. I remembered the Reno who had made the Cerullo shoes with me. Best to forget everything else. You made a film of Tina's life, using old clips, recordings. You asked me to listen to all the clever, delightful things she said. It was a way of keeping her there, but I wasn't sure it was a good idea. I kept reminding you to think of your own daughters. You were neglecting them. I was a professional writer. I had to make a living. I told you writing had almost become a chore. I told you I never liked my work. I didn't believe you. You were pale. We were worried about you. Occasionally, I persuaded you to take a short walk in the neighbourhood. Inevitably, we met the Solaris. They were confining themselves to the neighbourhood. There was a long list of people who were being murdered in Naples, and the Solaris barricaded themselves in the streets they knew. When we ran into them, they were friendly to me, they studiously ignored you, and my sister remained as distant from me as she could. There they are. I've just come from Mass. Let's ignore them. We can't. Hi, Lena. Do you see what my boys have in their hands? Books. I take them to the library every week after Mass, and if they don't read at least one book a week, I won't give them a lira. Am I right, Lena? I didn't say that since they had enough money to buy the whole of the Bibliotheca Nazionale, they didn't need to borrow books from the old library where Leela had taken out four books a week, using the names of everyone in her family, even those who couldn't read. Oh, would you like to come and eat with us, Leonard? I can't, thank you. Your daughters are lovely. I'd like them to get to know my boy, Silvio, is their cousin after all. I'd like you to tell the boys what they should read. You're an example to all of us. You and your daughters, we always talk about you. We say, here you are, 
living in this neighborhood, even though you're an important person. Today, everyone goes to school, but if you don't read the way you did, you end up nothing. Like some people I could mention, and then you stay malicious. Isn't that right? I really have to go. Come on, Lena. But it's true, isn't it? If you stop studying, you become malicious, and malice is ugly. He grabbed my wrist, as Marcello had done all those years ago. I was wearing the same bracelet, my mother's bracelet. Michele broke it. I'm so sorry. I'll have it fixed for you. It's all right. Give it back to me like that. Don't worry. No, it's my duty. You'll have it back like new. Marcello will take it to the jewellers. We really have to go. Bye. <laughs> You're even more defensive than you used to be. I'll never see that bracelet again. Not long after that encounter, the Solara brothers were shot in the street in full daylight. It was December 1986. What I've heard, Leela, is that they were shot right in front of the church. Michaela was shot twice, Marcello three times. Giliola ran away with her sons. Elisa grabbed Silvio. And they say Michaela died immediately, but Marcello sat down on a step and tried to button his jacket. But no one knows who killed them. No one saw anything, apparently. Some people were saying they both just hit their heads on the lava stone. And you know the strangest thing of all? This came in the post. Look how polished it is. It's my mother's bracelet. There was even a note from Marcello. Don't wear it. Don't let your daughters wear it either. What do you think? It was obviously an execution. Elisa is frightened they'll come and get her and Silvio. They were shit. I'm sorry for your sister, but she shouldn't have married Marcello. Everyone knows people like that end up getting killed. Leela, we've known them since they were boys. All men were once boys. We went to their pastry shop. They gave you work. It was convenient for them, and it was convenient for me. Michaela was a bastard, but so were you sometimes. Yeah, I should have done worse. Leela, you don't really think it was the Solaras who took away Tina? <laughs> if they did... They should have been drawn and quartered and had their hearts ripped out and their guts dumped in the street. If it wasn't them, whoever murdered them still did a good thing. If the assassins had whistled, I would have rushed to give them a hand. Leela, you're, you're very pale. You're not well. At least now we can walk around the neighbourhood without worrying about running into them. Some people are saying that the bullets that killed the Solaras hadn't been fired by anyone. And no one killed them, and no one will weep for them. Leela, him. what's wrong? I don't know. I'm losing a lot of blood these days. So I think I'm going to faint. I took you to hospital, where they discovered a fibromatous uterus. They took it out. When you came home, you decided you would stop work. One morning, with Gennaro's help, you carried up an old computer to my flat. I loved it from the start. My daughters and you laughed at my enthusiasm, and you took them downstairs to teach them more advanced skills. They all took to it, even Emma. And soon, Dede involved Gennaro, who, until then, had hated the sight of a computer. Dede was changing Gennaro. I simply thought he needed more confidence. <laughs> Not the kind of confidence you were thinking of. You saw what was happening. You never warned me. There were other things to worry about. The electoral campaign of 1987 was approaching. We read in the papers that Nadia Galliani had been arrested. Carmela came to the house, distraught. They didn't arrest Nadia. She turned herself in to bargain for a lighter sentence. Well, why don't you advise Pasquale to turn himself in? What? Turn himself in? To who? To the state. The state? Do you know what the, the state has been doing since 1945? Have you, have you noticed the thefts, the criminal collaborations by ministers, parliamentarians, judges? Shall I bring you the figures? Do you know nothing? I never heard any of this. Well, that's what the state is, and you want Pasquale to turn himself into those sorts of people. Shall we bet that Nadia does a few months in jail and comes out fine while they lock Pasquale and then throw away the key? Do you want to bet? Leela's right. 
If Nadia turned herself in, it means she's repented and yeah. now she'll throw all the blame onto Pasquale to get herself off. Yeah. But then the, maybe it's better for Pasquale to spend the rest of his life in prison rather than being killed. What do you think, Lanou? You began to go out, but no one knew where. You'd leave in the mornings and sometimes not come back until evening. Carmela thought you went to the old cemetery on the Doganella where you chose the grave of a child, any child, to mourn. I imagined that you walked and walked, not paying attention to anything, that you walked to numb your pain. You and Carmela were both wrong. I began to think it was time to leave Naples. And Naples you still didn't know. I had three daughters to look after and their fathers were absent. Nino only phoned occasionally, and the only time he wrote was to ask me to vote for him. Predictably, he had joined the Socialist Party lists. He sent a flyer with a short biography in which he mentioned three children, Albertino, Lydia and Emma. I didn't vote, but Emma was proud of the flyer and took it to school with her. Once Nino was elected, he sent a hasty and self-satisfied letter, but there was no address, no phone number. Emma, however, was thrilled when a teacher asked her one day if she was the daughter of the Honourable Nino Saratori. She was no longer in the shadow of the Erotta name. But Pietro decided to go to the United States. He'd been offered a post at Harvard. It was time to leave Naples. It soon began to feel urgent to get your daughters away from us. You had never noticed that Dede was head over heels in love with Gennaro. Dede, is what Leela says true? Are you in love with Gennaro? Yeah, I am. Is he in love with you? I don't know. I've loved him forever. And if he doesn't reciprocate? My life will have no meaning. Dede, you have exams. You'll probably come out top of your class. What are you planning to do? I'll stay with you until my exams are over, but then I want to go away from here. I hate Naples. Gennaro hates Naples. He wants to go to Bologna. There's freedom there. Dede, you're 15. You know that neither your father nor I will let you go. I'm going anywhere. What will you do for money? I'll work. And you'll leave me and your sisters? Well, someday, Mama. We'll have to separate. I called Pietro. I asked him to come to Naples without delay to talk to Dede. He had endless engagements, but he came at last. I tried. We talked for a long time, but you know what Dede's like. She functions by theorems. She always knows what she's going to do next. She'll go to bed with them. Oh, yes. <laughs> she has it all planned. Well, first she'll pass her exams. Then, immediately after her exams, she'll make a declaration to Gennaro. She'll lose her virginity. They'll go off together and live by begging, thus putting the work ethic in crisis. Yeah, it's all right for you to laugh, but you're going to Boston, leaving me with this crisis and the other girls. I'm only reporting her plans. And if Gennaro wants, they'll both come to Boston. I'll break her legs. They might break yours. There's nothing you can do, Lena. I could probably keep Dede away from Gennaro, but there's Leela downstairs. Mm. She'd consider it an insult. You have to help Leela. I had a long talk with her. She's trying to do everything she can to emerge from her grief, but she can't. She's not doing anything. She stopped working. All she does is walk around Naples. Actually, she's spending her days at the Biblioteca Nazionale. She told me. Leela? She hasn't told you. You must urge her to continue. It's unacceptable that a person with that brilliant mind stopped school in year six. She's learning everything she can about Naples. She told you all that? There's an inferno inside that unsatisfied mind. And I must say, I wouldn't want to enter it for a second. We talked well into the night. Not just about you. About politics, my books, a new essay of his. And, inevitably, about ourselves. Nothing was right for you. I was inadequate in everything. Only the other man was perfect. And now? Well, he pretended he was righteous, but he's ended up in the socialist gang. They're completely corrupt, as you know. I'm afraid I was very wrong about Nino. Oh, Eleanor, how you've tormented me. And I've loved you so much. We have two children. And I still love you. Pietro, come to bed. Together. How 
else. It was a tender goodbye. We knew it would never happen again. I woke him at six in the morning, before the girls were up. I accompanied him to the car and went and bought the papers. I was thinking of our life together and the fierce argument we'd had when Pasquale and Nadia came to our house. Pietro had called them murderers, but I couldn't accept that term. Not for Pasquale. As soon as I was back in the flat, you called from downstairs. I asked if he had read the papers. I'd just heard on the radio that Pasquale had been arrested in Sereno, 50 kilometres from Naples. Carmela and Pasquale were our childhood friends. They'd known instinctively that the limbs of a man are not nourished when he fills the belly of another, and that those who make you believe that ought sooner or later to get what they deserve. I sometimes wondered myself if a modest amount of violence wasn't needed to confront the fierce world we lived in. I looked for good lawyers for Pasquale. I tracked down Nino. I told him I was bringing Imma to see him. We both left for Rome. We had to present ourselves to the Parliament buildings. I kept showing my papers and repeating loudly that here was the daughter of the Honourable Nino Saratori. Nino finally arrived. Well-dressed, radiant, preceded by a very attractive secretary. He took Emma on his knee. He paid attention to her. She was rapturous. And only after a while could I talk about Pasquale. Now, what do you expect from me, Lena? To find out if he's in good health and to make sure he gets the full protection of the law. Is he cooperating with the law? No, and I doubt he ever will. It would be better if he did. Like your former girlfriend, Nadia. She's behaving the only way possible if she doesn't want to spend the rest of her life in jail. Nadia's a spoiled girl. Pasquale has principles. Well, I'll look into it. I'm here to make sure that the rights of everyone are protected under the law. But that also means the rights of the relatives of the people he killed. You don't play at being a rebel, shed real blood and then cry, we have rights. Do you understand, Emma? I left uneasy, and I doubted Nino would do anything. But for Emma, it was the most important day of her seven years of life. Nino did call, some time later. Lena, I don't want to talk on the phone. You'd better come to Rome as soon as you can. Nadia is not only blaming Pasquale for all the political crimes of the whole Naples area, but she's also accusing him of having murdered Gino, Bruno Saccavo, of being involved in Manuela Solara's death, and even that of the Solara brothers. What agreement did she make with the Cabinieri to say all that? You know it's a pile of lies. I only know one thing for sure. She's ruining a lot of people who thought they were safe. Tell Leela to be careful, because Nadia has always hated her. How tawdry everything has become, Nino. What do you mean? Look how high the two of us have climbed. You shouldn't have left me, Lena. We have a great life here. But your greatest concern is still for Leela. I've suddenly understood something about you, Nino. All the women in your life, Nadia, the daughter of a professor... Eleonora, the daughter of bankers, even me, with my successful book and connection to publishers, have helped you in your ambitions. Only with Leela did you risk those ambitions. You could have been killed. You could have ruined your future. Leela didn't fit any purpose in your life. No wonder Nadia hates her. Leela never submitted to anything. She took you away from Nadia. She made fun of Nadia's revolutionary beliefs. She's from the real proletariat. I used to admire Nadia when I saw her with you at school, even when she was with Pasquale, and seemed willing to strip herself of every privilege. But what was her purpose? The stupidity of shedding blood and then blaming it all on a bricklayer. She saw Pasquale as the harbinger of a new humanity and now she's going to use him to reduce her own responsibilities. I feel sick. I'm going. I don't really want to see you again. When I got back to Naples, I went to your flat before going to mine. I wanted to warn you about Nadia. Seriously, Leela, can Nadia hurt you? You can only be hurt if you love someone. I don't love anyone. You love Gennaro? Gennaro's gone. What? 
Look at this. <laughs> Wrote beautifully as a child, but this is illiterate. It was indeed a badly spelt, laborious note in which Gennaro explained he was tired of everything. Leela, Enzo, and was going to Bologna to meet a friend of his. Did he go alone? <laughs> you're, you're afraid he left with Dede, aren't you? <laughs> I rushed up to my flat. I found Dede on the bed, crying. I assumed she'd been rejected by Gennaro. I felt only relief. It's all right, darling. I promise you, it's really for the best. He was never right for you. It'll pass. You'll see. What are you talking about? You don't understand anything, do you? All you think about is yourself and the crap you write. They've gone. Both. Together. Who? Gennaro. With Elsa. Leela! Leela! Your son didn't go alone. He took Elsa with him. Elsa? Yes, and Elsa is a minor. Gennaro is nine years older, I swear to God. I'll go to the police and report him. Well, well Gennaro may be useless, but look at the damage he's been able to inflict. He's made both of the well-brought-up ladies lose their heads. Oh. I can't believe it. <laughs> oh, come on, Lena. Oh. Come on, calm down. Oh. Calm down. There's really more to laugh about than cry. You might think it's funny, but <laughs> I'm going to the police. Right, well, go to the police then. <laughs> Daddy? What now? I want to know where they went. Now. How would I know? You know that friend in Bologna. What's his name? Address. I'm not going to tell you. That would be a betrayal. You're going to tell me right now. Fine. I'll find the address myself. I can't believe it. What now? Your sister stole the money I kept in the drawer. And all the jewellery, including my mother's bracelet. The bracelet I promised you could have. Eventually, I forced Dede to give me the number of Gennaro's friend in Bologna. I called him. I said I knew he sold heroin and I would make so much trouble for him he'd never get out of jail. He swore he knew nothing. I went back to yours. Sit down, Lena. I've heard everything. I want to go to Bologna right away. Leela, I want you to come with me. There's no need. When they run out of money, they'll come back. Well, how much money did Gennaro take? None, of course. Elsa took a good sum of money and oh. all of my jewellery. Well, you didn't know how to bring her up. Leela! <sighs> Look, my son is the drug addict. My son didn't study. My son reads and writes badly. My son is good for nothing. But the one who steals is her daughter. The one who betrays her sister is Elsa. I'll go with you. Come, let's go to Bologna. <sighs> I don't want to report Gennaro. I just want to find my daughter. We'll manage you. You'll see. I want to leave Naples. Leela and I can't continue fighting over who brought up our children better. She's in acute pain, Lena. You have to try to understand. If a being a few years old dies, eventually you resign yourself. But if a child disappears, you no longer know anything about her. There's not a thing that remains in her place. Will Tina come back? Will she never come back? Where is she? Is she on the streets or with rich people who long for a child? And if we come across her on some street, will we recognize her? I saw in the headlights the tears in his eyes. We drove on through the night. We spoke. I don't think I ever met a man with such a sensibility as Enzo's. He asked me about my work. I told him how hard I had worked not to let myself be marginalised. You see, with what energy you speak of your work, no matter how difficult it is, it's anchored you and more than that, it's engaged your feelings. Life drags you with it. For you, Tina is an atrocious episode, but already an old one. For Leela, time stopped the minute we lost her. She can't help feeling bitter towards everything that is alive and growing. And you, Enzo? When Tina was born, it was as if a light switched on. 
in my head now that light has gone out I don't know what the purpose of work is anymore why make money we're not far from Bologna try to get some sleep but in Bologna there was no trace of Elsa and Gennaro although Gennaro's friend frightened by Enzo's fierce calm dragged us through all the streets where they might be found I began to insist on going to the police Wait a little longer, Lena. We may have news from home. Gennaro is ruined, Elsa. You should look at your daughters as they really are. That's what I'm always doing. I'm not so sure, Lena. Elsa would do anything to make Dede suffer. And the two only ever agree if they can torment Imma. You're getting that from Leela to hurt me. No. Leela loves you, admires you, and is fond of your daughters. It's what I observe. I'm saying this now to help you be reasonable. I know we'll find them. But we didn't, and decided to return to Naples. Near Florence, Enzo made another phone call to you, in case there was some news. Leela says to call Dede. Oh no, is Emma ill? Dede, darling, what's wrong? I'm going to the United States. I'm going to study there. Wait, what? We'll talk about all that another time. Elsa will only return to the flat when I'm gone. You should know that. We have to find her first, Dede. The bitch telephoned a little while ago. She's at Grandma's with Gennaro. Oh. Adele. Lena, my dear. We've been expecting you. You're exhausted. Come in. Are they here? Yes. Both Elsa and Gennaro. I've given them a nice room. A room together. How did you get here? You look like you've been travelling all night. You need something to eat. Then you can talk to Elsa. Pietro rang. We discussed what sort of parents you'd both been and how you might have failed our grandchildren. So you're saying I've been a terrible mother and it's all my fault. Children need a continuity of affection and stability. You had your work. Well... Pietro will have a chance to prove what a great father he is. Dede wants to go and study in America. Pietro is very busy now. He has a prestigious job. I was busy too. Anyway, Dede is like Pietro. Whatever he says, she'll join him in Boston. Here's Elsa. I'll leave you two together. I don't care what you're going to say, Mama. I love him. I hate you. First of all, Elsa, you're going to give me back the money you stole, as well as all the jewellery. Now. And don't you ever dare touch any of my things again because believe me I won't hesitate to report you and Gennaro to the police I didn't want to hurt Dede I really didn't listen I'll leave you here for the summer and in September come back and finish your studies I'm never leaving Gennaro he can come too and he can live with us in the flat are you serious what will Aunt Leela say she'll agree happy of course I should have suspected Elsa would involve her grandmother. It's clear she planned the whole thing. Gennaro's simply following along. I spoke to both of them, and we all agreed Gennaro and Elsa can come and live with me in the autumn while Elsa goes back to school. Is that all right with you? If it's all right with you, it's all right with me. Dede still insists on joining her father in Boston. I feel that in just a few days I've lost two daughters. They don't ever say something like that you haven't lost anything you've gained a son you encouraged him oh, right now you want to blame me for what your children get up to i'm so tired i need to go to bed you always did or said something to disturb the equilibrium of my life the carelessness of words loss Losing a daughter. I was afraid that if my daughters left me, life would no longer have meaning. Where was it ever written that lives should have meaning? Boston can be very cold, Daddy. It's fine, Mama. If I need a coat, I'll get one there. You can still change your mind. <laughs> and live with that bitch? Never. Anyway, I want to live with Papa. But, Mama... What's the matter? You've gone pale. There's a glass of water, Daddy. Mama, can I sit on your lap? Of course, darling, come. 
You're so tall. <laughs> Don't cry, Daddy. It's all right. You'll have a great time. And you can always come back. Can I come on your lap too, Mum? Let go, Mum. You're squeezing me. I can't breathe. Emma, you're right at least once a week. <laughs> Mum, stop crying. It's hard for me, Daddy. Why? The only thing that's ever counted for you are your work and your relationship with Aunt Leela. There's nothing that's not swallowed up inside them. The real punishment for Elsa will be to have to come back and live here. If I reeled from the harshness of Dede's words, I couldn't help noticing that she was at least calling her sister by name. I took Dede to the airport, and in early September of 1988, Elsa came back with Gennaro. As promised, I gave them a room to themselves. Gennaro was affectionate. Or rather completely submissive to Elsa and to Emma, who treated him like a servant. Oh, Leela. I could hear you and Enzo quarrelling, shouting. I could hear Tina's name filtering through the floor. Then I would hear the door slam and your steps as they mingled with the sounds of the Stradoni. Naples. It was Emma who first told me about your explorations. Sometimes you took her with you. You explained Naples to her. You fired her imagination. What a city, Emma. Eh? Look at what a splendid and important city this is. In the city, where so many areas were once swamps, everything was built and then everything was torn down. Here, the people don't trust talk, but they talk all the time. <laughs> look, look, there's Vesuvius, which reminds you every day that the greatest undertakings of powerful men, the most splendid works, can be reduced to nothing in a few seconds by fire and earthquakes and ash and the sea. Now, we'll go to Piazza Falcone, where the spirits of dead children live. But first, we'll go to Porta Nolano where they say a child can often be seen at night. You know, Emma, spirits don't just exist in places like alleys or ancient gates. They exist in people's ears and eyes, when the eyes look inside rather than out. And sometimes in the voice, when it speaks, because words are full of ghosts. Words are full of ghosts, aren't they? Yes, and so are images. Now, if you go to the Bibliotheca Nazionale, spirits jump out from the pages. In Naples, these things happen without laws or decrees. In Naples, there's clarity, Emma. I was convinced you were writing about Naples. I confronted you. All this work on Naples, you must be writing about it. No, oh, you're the writer. You're not answering me. To write, you have to want something to survive you. I don't even have the desire to live. If I could eliminate myself now, as we're speaking, I'd be happy. Why would I start writing? But if you ever did, you'd let me see it. I could get it published. Oh, God. <laughs> I used to love computers. You know, they seem so clean, but computers force you to leave traces of yourself everywhere, as if you were peeing and shitting on yourself all the time. <laughs> you know what my favourite key is? Delete. It was not the first time you had talked about disappearing, but I knew you wouldn't contemplate suicide, not even in your worst moments. What's the name? It's so important to you. Eleanor Greco. Really? It's only a sack with a name tied on it, randomly filled with... Blood, words, shit, and petty thoughts. Well, all I want is to untie my name, slip it off me, throw it away, and forget it. I knew what you were like when you became obsessively focused on something. Your wanderings through Naples became longer and longer. I worried sometimes and stayed awake, afraid the shadow of Tina was joining you wondering whether you were exploring the catacombs with their rows and rows of death heads. Sometimes I didn't sleep until I heard your footsteps and the door of your flat slamming shut. One day, after you'd disappeared, I saw with alarm the police heading towards our building. 
I was sure something had happened to you. But the police had come to arrest Enzo. Nadia had named names upon names. The order of the world we had grown up with was dissolving. The exploitation of man by man, the logic of maximum profit, which before had been considered abominations, were returning to become the linchpins of freedom and democracy. And all the accounts that remained open in revolutionary organisations were being closed with a heavy hand. People like Nino and Armando Galliani had intuited that the climate was changing and had quickly adapted to the new order. But not Pasquale and Enzo. Pasquale continued his war in prison and never said a word, either to exonerate himself or to implicate anyone else. Enzo would have talked, explaining his feelings as a communist while denying all the charges. It seems Nadia had dug up the time Pasquale and Enzo were involved in the Worker Student Collective in the Via de Tribunali. The one she and Armando were so keen to lead. She implicated them in small demonstrations carried out against the property of NATO officials. But Nadia may also have implicated Enzo in all of Pasquale's actions, accusing Enzo of planning them. It took two years and the most expensive lawyers I could find to get Enzo out. When Enzo came out of prison with no charges against him, the damage had already been done. Rumours flew. People began to think he really had committed atrocities while remaining camouflaged by the work of our company. You'd stopped working. The business was in trouble. We sold it for a few hundred million lira. We had thought it was worth billions. In the spring of 1992, you separated by mutual consent. Enzo gave you most of the money and went to look for work in Milan. I was sorry to say goodbye to him. Stay near her, Lena. Leela is a woman who's not comfortable with herself. She'll have a hard old age. Write to me. Please. I will. He did for a while. I answered. He called me a few times and then that was all. It was the time of breakups. As I had long expected, Gennaro and Elsa broke up. Their love had lasted six months. She failed her exams. She took them again. And then she decided she too would study in the States. She didn't say goodbye to me. But she told me she understood our friendship and that you were the best person she'd ever known. Gennaro was desperate after Elsa's departure. But he stayed with you. And you began to urge me to move away from Naples. Why stay? I couldn't understand you. You wanted me to send Emma to Nino. She was so proud of him. That was then. <laughs> <laughs> when I'd last seen Nino, he was self-satisfied, bloated. I told him he was worse than the Solaras. He was using my fame and Immer to get himself re-elected. He asked her to pose with him. I refused. She was angry with me. But the long arm of justice... He wasn't re-elected. And then we saw on television one evening that the Honourable Nino Saratori had been arrested for corruption. Even Guido Orota was under suspicion. I thought of calling Adele, but unsure of what to say, I called Maria Rosa instead. Well, Lena, what a surprise. It's been a very long time. I've been following your glittering career. You can't open a newspaper without seeing your name. I called about Guido. I was so sorry to hear... My father thought you could change one thing here, one thing there. But when you do that, you change nothing. And you're forced to enter into a system of lies. And either you agree to repeat those lies, or they get rid of you. But surely he didn't take money. Of course he didn't. Father never put a single lira that wasn't legal in his pocket. They know that. Guido was exonerated. And I called Adele. I'm so glad Pietro, Dede and Elsa are in the States, where this sort of thing doesn't happen. The girls are doing very well. They love it there. They call me all the time. This is a country where one is exposed to every insult going. We should all emigrate. I was concerned. Is Guido all right after all that? May I say hello to him? He's resting, but I'll pass on your good wishes. My husband's only crime was to be surrounded by those new literary types with no ethics. Those young arrivistes ready for anything. Scum. 
You'd exerted yourself for Pasquale, for Enso, but you showed very little concern for Nino during his trial. When we were in Ischia, whenever he needed money, he asked Bruno Sicavo, and he never paid the money back. Nino only ever wanted to climb higher and higher. If he did something wrong, it was only to make himself more likeable. He appeared in the papers and on television, looking pale, grizzled, with the expression of a child who swears it wasn't him. Emma was upset, and she'd lost the prestige of being the daughter of an honourable member with her teachers and classmates. They shunned her now. I told her Nino would soon return to Parliament. I told her I didn't think he would, but there was no need for him to be an important person for her to love him. Nino returned to Parliament in 1994. He attacked the judiciary and shifted further and further to the right. You know, Mama, you may write books, but Aunt Leela sees the future. She knows everything, and it's all in her computer. What's in her computer, Emma? Everything. Everything about Naples. Everything else. Lots. What were you writing? I decided to ask you directly. I've already told you I'm studying Naples. I'm, I'm reading the accounts of travellers. Everyone, century after century, praised the great port, the, the sea, the ships, the castles, Vesuvius, tall and, and black with its disdainful flames. But then, century after century, they began to complain about the inefficiency, the, the corruption, the, the physical and moral poverty, no decipherable order, only an unruly and uncontrollable crowd on the streets, cluttered with, with sellers of every possible merchandise, people speaking at the top of their voices, beggars, urchins. <laughs> oh, Lena, there's no city that gives up such clamour and so much noise as Naples. I was leaving Naples for the second time. I'd lived in Naples for 30 years, and yet I knew almost nothing about it. You in a few sentences, had transformed it into the most vibrant place in the world. You. Always you. Thank you for taking such good care of Emma, Leela. She's learned to love Naples through oh, you. I've always helped Emma, not just now. She was Tina's friend. Tina loved her. Maybe even more than me. Lena. What? I don't understand how you how you never thought of it. What? But you remember that newspaper article and the photograph of you and Tina with the caption saying that she was your daughter. Did it never occur to you that they may have taken Tina because of that photo? They thought they were stealing your daughter. Instead, they stole mine. But why? It, you were always in the newspapers. Maybe they, they wanted money from you. Is that why you took such care of Emma? To keep her safe? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything anymore. How's your packing going? I found a flat in Turin, and I'm going to run a small publishing house. Oh. Leela, if you ever write anything, I don't know, about Naples, about Tina, the neighbourhood, you'll let me see it. You're the writer, Lena. I wonder... During those years in Turin, I became obsessed with the book you might be writing. I wanted it, and I feared it. My books were selling less and less well. I was facing the possibility of old age and poverty. The men in my life usually came to me because they wanted to give me their manuscripts to read. I was being forgotten, and I wondered if your book with the genius you had displayed in your childhood story, The Blue Fairy, would manifest itself, eclipse us all, and I would be annihilated. You have to love yourself to write, Lele. I went to Naples in 2005. We walked the streets. I talked about Dede, Elsa, Emma. I now had grandchildren. You talked about Naples. Hey, listen. Listen to all these different languages spoken in Naples right now. I've never left the city. I've never even taken a train. But the whole world has come to me. 
<laughs> and that's when the news of Giliola Solara's death hey. spread. Come. We rushed to the gardens where her corpse had been found. Her enormous body sprawled on the ground. You know, I look after my appearance, but I don't recognise myself in the mirror. I move differently. Giliola was our friend. She was the beautiful daughter of the pastry maker. She caught Michaela Solara, had children with him. And now look. Am I going to look like that one day? I don't feel any different. Isn't Giliola's story one of the saddest you can think of? <laughs> it's not a story, Lena. Listen. Write about her if you want. But don't you dare ever write about me. I'll come and interfere with your computer. I'll erase your files. I'll change them. I'm warning you. That warning of yours. But even so, I did write about you. I wrote a book called A Friendship. It was short, 80 pages. I knew I'd broken our unwritten agreement, but I thought that if it was good, you would be grateful to me for saying things you didn't even have the courage to say to yourself. When did I ever lack courage? The book came out. It was a success. I was fated again. And then Gennaro called one day to tell me you had disappeared completely, leaving no trace. No trace at all. When I read the proofs of my book, I knew that the threat to come and interfere with my computer hadn't materialised. The book was mine. Mine only. Even if it was about us, about you, about Tina. But when I reread it, I wasn't sure. How can you distinguish between what's yours and what's mine? I returned to Naples only twice, and there was still no sign of you. I attended Nino's mother's funeral and saw Nino, large, bloated, his hair thinning, talking loudly, giving the impression of wasted time, useless labour. I managed to visit Pasquale in prison several times. I've just got a degree in astronomical geography. <laughs> I plan to take a further degree. That's wonderful, Pasquale. If I'd have known that to get a degree all you need is time, and to be shut up in a place where you don't have to worry about earning a living. I'd have done it ages ago. You need discipline as well. Yes. You need to learn by heart pages and pages of books. It's great. Remember when prizes were assigned to the most diligent readers and top came Leela's father, Leela's brother, Leela's mother, and Leela... Using a relative's cars to take out books. <laughs> Remember the shoes? When she was like Jackie Kennedy. Remember when she designed that shoe shop? Hey, when she learned programming. Do you have any idea where she is? Hmm, she'll be doing her intelligent and imaginative things somewhere. You'll see. And when Leela decides to show up, she'll show up. Where are you? Will you ever return? <laughs> Yesterday, after going to get a newspaper as usual and walking the Labrador, I found a package on top of my post box. It was roughly wrapped. My name wasn't written anywhere. I opened the wrapping. There were two dolls. Tina and No. The Lost Dolls. <laughs> you can play with her if you like, but you have to give me yours in exchange. Here, be a good girl, Tina. Leela's going to hold you. The dolls we accused Don Achille of stealing. And he gave us money to buy new dolls. We didn't buy dolls. We bought little women. I wrote The Blue Fairy. That was the beginning? Yes. That was the beginning of our story. Lena. Leela? 
Leela, are you here? Stop! She's gone. What you do, I do. There. And now we'll have to go down to the cellar and get our dolls back. In episode three of The Story of a Lost Child by Eleanor Ferrante, the part of Lena was played by Monica Dolan and Leela by Anastasia Hilly. Adele, Sylvestre Latuzel, Nino, Daniel Flynn, Enzo, Carl Prekop, Stefano, Hugh Kermode, Carmela, Louise Calf, Armando, Josh Dillon, Maria Rosa, Claudia Jolly, Michele, Daniel Ryan, Pietro, Ferdinand Kingsley, Pasquale, Nicholas Gleaves, Gennaro, Tom Davis, Emma, Grace Piercy, Dede, Ella Dale, and Elsa, Georgia Taft. Marisa was played by Sarah Markland. The story of the lost child was translated by Anne Goldstein and dramatized for radio by Timberlake Wurtenbaker. It was directed by Celia DeWolf and was a peer production for BBC Radio.